Thank you. That concludes ministerial statement on the Scottish Government's response to the report by the Independent Advisor on Education Reform. The next item of business is a debate on motion 3493 in the name of Keith Brown on Economic Crime, Transparency and Enforcement Bill. And I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now or place R in the chat function. And I call on Keith Brown to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, I would like to reiterate this Government's uh, and Scotland's and I assume this Parliament's unqualified support for Ukrainian sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity uh, and unequivocal support for the package of international economic sanctions against the Russian invasion. I am sure that the whole Chamber will be united in supporting the actions we are taking to address this flagrant violation of international law by Putin's regime. The people of Ukraine should know that Scotland stands with them in the face of this unprovoked and unjustifiable aggression against their nation, and they can be assured that we will take all possible steps to sever ties to Putin's regime and those individuals who support it. That is why I am seeking the agreement of Parliament supporting the legislative consent motion on the economic crime Transparency and Enforcement Bill introduced into the UK Parliament on 1 March. The Bill has passed its common stages and it is with the House of Lords. The Bill brings forward a register of overseas entities and strengthens measures around unexplained wealth orders and the enforcement of sanctions. This will help the UK to counter illicit financial activity from Russia and elsewhere more effectively. The Scottish Government shares and supports those objectives and the provisions in the Bill. With respect to the measures in the LCM, I intend also to talk briefly on them separately. Uh, part 1 of the Bill creates a register of overseas entities to provide transparency of beneficial ownership across the UK to tackle money laundering. The register will apply to all overseas entities that own land in Scotland and throughout the UK, who will have to provide information about their beneficial owners to Companies House. The register is designed to prevent criminals from hiding behind anonymous companies and laundering money in UK property and will provide more information for law enforcement to help track down those using UK property as a money laundering vehicle. Property law and its interface with companies law and the interface with the legal systems of jurisdictions around the world is a very complex matter. Broadly, the split between devolved and reserved powers lies not in the powers in this UK Government Bill, but between the entities to which it applies. If I can use an example to illustrate this, a registered overseas company would fall within reserve powers but an overseas charity would fall within devolved powers. This means that the ROE provisions legislate to this limited extent for devolved competence. We have liaised with the UK Government over these proposals for a number of years, and I especially welcome the engagement over the last week. UK Government Ministers wrote to me yesterday to confirm they will be tabling an amendment to be considered during Lord's Committee stage, introducing a statutory mechanism to consult Scottish Ministers on regulations made under the Sunset Clause in the Bill. Transparency of ownership has long been a key objective of our land reform policy, and the 2016 Land Reform Act included provisions to establish a register of persons with a controlled interest in land. Establishment of the register was delayed slightly by the pandemic, but is on track to be launched on 1 April. Although the policy objective of the RCI is to shed light on who is responsible for decisions about property, whereas the ROE is seeking to tackle money laundering by shedding light on who benefits from that property, there is clearly some overlap, and in due course we will review any duplication. Together, the RCI and the ROE will provide a better understanding of who owns, controls and benefits from Scotland's land, questions that we have been seeking to answer for a very long time. Part 2 of the Bill seeks to strengthen the system of civil recovery of property obtained through unlawful conduct by improving effectiveness of the unexplained wealth order investigative procedures and to assist enforcement authorities in taking action against kleptocrats and criminals laundering funds in the UK. The reforms will assist UWOs and explained wealth orders to be sought against property held in trust and other complex ownership structures. In Scotland, the Civil Recovery Unit, acting on behalf of Scottish Ministers, can apply to the Court of Session for a UWO. UWOs, though, are just one investigatory tool under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, but it is a powerful tool. It is a court order requiring persons who are suspected of involvement in or being connected with serious criminality or who are politically exposed persons to explain how they obtain certain property where the value exceeds their known lawfully obtained income. 
The bill includes provisions that will assist enforcement authorities to investigate the origin of property and thereby recover the assets obtained by unlawful conduct. The bill increases the scope of existing powers in the 2002 Act to expand the list of persons against whom an I a UWO can be sought, enabling them to be served on persons who are responsible officers and expected to have some control of the asset. In situations where the property holder is not responsible for financing the acquisition, but where it may have been obtained through unlawful conduct, the bill contains an alternative test to the income requirement, which must be currently met for UWOs. And this helps ensure that property held via complex ownership structures falls within scope of the UWO regime. The bill also provides a power for Scottish ministers or the Lord Advocate to seek an extension to the length of an interim freezing order. These orders prevent a person in dealing with any property subject to an order and will increase the time to a total of 186 days for the civil recovery unit or the Lord Advocate to review material provided to them. The bill also reforms court expenses rules so that expenses are only payable by Scottish ministers or the Lord Advocate in court actions relating to an, a, a UWO if they have acted improperly. The LCM sets out the relevant provisions that require consideration by Parliament insofar as they fall within the legislative competence of this Parliament or they confer function, functions on the Scottish ministers so as to alter their executive competence in relation to devolved matters. Uh, finally, President Officer, it is worth noting that this bill also seeks to strengthen sanctions measures which fall out with the LCM in light of Russia's aggression towards Ukraine. I will do. I'm very, Stephen Kerr. I'm very grateful to the government for giving, giving way, and, and it is right that our actions uh, are focused on upholding the rights of the Ukrainian people. But does the cabinet secretary agree with me that it's important that we don't slip into Russophobia? Uh, that our target is Putin and his grisly gang, and not the Russian people. Cabinet secretary. I think that is an important point, and one which I do see increasingly made, for example, by sports people who uh, understand that certain sports people have been caught up in sanctions and will not be able to compete, which is very dear to them. But I do think these actions are necessary to undermine Putin's regime, even if they sometimes uh, inevitably uh, catch other people in the middle of that. No, we should not get involved in Russophobia. Uh, the government fully supports the application of sanctions against Russia, though, because of their aggression against Ukraine, and we will continue to do all we can to support the UK government in this regard. I would like to close by extending the Scottish uh, Government's appreciation to the Parliament authorities for their insistence in expediting this LCM at such short notice to ensure that Parliament can vote on it today. And I would ask members to support the LCM. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Michael Mara to speak to and move Amendment 3493.1 up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I rise to move the amendment in my name. As we meet here today, Russia's war in Ukraine enters its 14th day, 14 days of horror, the likes of which we as a European community had said never again. Our thoughts, of course, are with every Ukrainian and every person who has been impacted by Putin's war. Our thoughts are with the Ukrainian armed forces and those volunteers who have taken up arms to protect their sovereignty, their homes and their families. And all words are meaningless if our actions fall short. It is our duty here in this place to do everything in our powers to increase the pressure on Putin and his cronies to shorten this war of aggression and to save lives. Over 400 civilian souls and thousands of combatants already lost and counting. It is right that we are legislating at pace, as the Cabinet Secretary says, in order to ensure the toughest of sanctions in the shortest period of time, and these benches support the legislative consent motion in front of Parliament today. My amendment sets out that there should be no backdate on the land and assets which the Russian kleptocracy needs to declare here in Scotland. There is no logical sense as to why we must cut off at the 2014 date the land and assets they must declare. The Scottish Government has said as much in their memorandum of response, and SNP members, I am sure, will be good to that word by a backing uh, Labour's amendment tonight, and I would uh, implore the Cabinet Secretary to lead in that regard. The people of this land have, I believe, a right to know who holds legal ownership of our common treasury, for which we are but stewards. Too often and for too long, the opaque nature of land registration has made it difficult to enforce proper care for our environment, to resolve disputes, to encourage or to enforce development and to deliver redistribution. Our beloved country, where we live and raise our children, cannot be allowed to be a smuggler's cove for capital on the seas of dark money that course around the globe. They may own it, but Scotland belongs to us. 
We must honour it rather than allow it to be defiled by corrupt gains and blood monies. In achieving this greater good, there will be practical benefits too, and there are significant technicalities to which ministers must urgently address themselves at this time, which the Cabinet Secretary um, began to lay out in his speech. I would appreciate the, if the Minister took on board some of these points. Our amendment sought to seek maximum consensus through brevity, but there are other issues to consider. We must ensure that Scottish regulations that the Cabinet Secretary discussed, due to come into force in a few weeks' time, do not create uh, an unnecessary twin-track system. Um, and the Cabinet Secretary's intention that we should move quickly to review these, uh, that situation, I would suggest that rescinding the regulations to avoid confusion and to defeat the common purpose of those laws, both sets of laws, would be the correct thing to do. Ministers should be looking to take more action on persons of significant control uh, to ensure that the land and assets controlled from abroad through trusts at home are declared and cannot be used to distort ownership. Take, for example, the Tolkien Estate in Murray, Scotland's most expensive sporting estate, owned by Yuri Scheffler, one of the richest drinks producers in the world, um, who, under this proposed legislation, will not have to declare ownership due to the intricacies of the chain of ownership. It would be effective if regulations relating to persons of significant control could be included in this legislation, but I do understand there is a second bill within, coming within the next year. We are being promised at Westminster, and I do believe it is vital the Scottish Government make significant representations on these issues and more to the UK Government. We must also see robust enforcement of regulations from the Crown Office. Currently, regulations are clearly either not working or not being enforced appropriately. While it is, of course, not for government to instruct the Crown Office, it is a point of reasonable inquiry to gain insight into how these regulations are being operationalised. We are told that there are billions of pounds that should have been and perhaps still could be realised in fines for non-compliance. If there is no enforcement, there is no deterrent. Presiding officer, henceforth, let us agree as a parliament that we will do all we can to maximise transparency in every way so that people can understand who owns the land to which we belong, who is profiting from it, and whose influence is physically etched into our country. We are quickly responding to an emerging situation, but we have allowed the situation of untransparent ownership to develop. Over countless years, in an attempt to avert our eyes to protect interests, we have built a secretive landscape of ownership, which does nothing but protect and defend elites. The Government should right now make a forthright commitment to change that. Scotland can no longer be a safe haven to protect Putin's interests. Thank you. I now call on Donald Cameron. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. And in the spirit of transparency, can I refer to my register of interests as an owner of land uh, in the Highland Council region? Um, can I begin by associating myself and these benches uh, with the remarks that the Cabinet sec Secretary has made about the ongoing situation in Ukraine, we share his concern about the profound impact that this invasion is having, first and foremost, of course, on the Ukrainian people, but also the Ukrainian community here in Scotland. And I met this morning with members of the Edinburgh Ukrainian Club and offered my party's support and solidarity to them and those they represent. This crisis has led the UK Government to bring forward the Economic tri Crime Transparency and Enforcement Bill the contents of which were originally due to be part of a more wide-ranging piece of legislation, and as others have said, it may be that there is further UK legislation to come. However, given the situation that we presently face and the need for urgency to target illicit finance, including from Russia, it is right that this particular bill is before us today. And I welcome the fact the Scottish Government has recommended consent uh, and that it broadly agrees with the robust action being taken by the UK Government to reform unexplained wealth orders, uh, powers, and introduce a register of overseas entities. And I welcome both the tone and substance of the Cabinet Secretary's speech tonight. There are difficult and complex questions of law about what is reserved and devolved in this area. Uh, but I think it's fair to say we are all broadly on the same page here. Can I welcome the support of the Labour Party in Westminster uh, as well? Uh, I feel that it shows on issues like this, political unity can achieve positive outcomes. And I should add that we are supporting uh, Michael Marra's amendment today, and I'll return to that in a moment. This bill introduces significant and timely changes that will improve transparency and give both the UK and the Scottish Government greater powers of enforcement. The proposed Register of Overseas Entities, ROE, will require anonymous foreign owners of UK property 
to reveal their real identities and prevent individuals hiding behind secretive chains of shell companies. Uh, the creation of such a register will ensure that there is a level playing field with property owned by UK companies, who of course at the moment need to disclose their beneficial owners to Companies House, and it will impose sanctions for non-compliance. The Cabinet Secretary also uh, mentioned the UK Government have committed to tabling an amendment to introduce a statutory consulting mechanism with Scottish Ministers on regulations uh, that are, part, are, are within this Parliament's legislative competence. There are some areas of minor contentions, um, namely that the register will apply retrospectively to property brought up to 20 years ago in England and Wales, but here in Scotland only from December 2014. And the legislative consent memorandum of the government says that they have not explored extension to an earlier date, and that is what uh, Michael Murray's amendment uh, attempts to um, uh, consider. Um, land registration is, of course, a devolved matter, and uh, um, we support and have supported greater transparency in land ownership in Scotland, and for those reasons, we will be supporting Michael Murray's reasons amendment. Uh, on the same subject as others have also noted, there are overlaps between the Scottish regulations on the register of persons holding a controlled interest in land, RCI as it's known as, and this bill. Uh, the UK Government has reduced the grace period in which foreign owned properties must be registered in this bill down from in the initial 18 months to six months, and that's a positive step forward. I do wonder if the Scottish Government believes that the grace period in the RCI regulations should also be reduced from 12 to six months. Uh, there is an overlap. The ROE is, of course, directed at money laundering, as the Cabinet Secretary said, not transparency of land ownership. But there may be room for joint working here if, for instance, overseas entities require to report to RCI, should they also have to report to the Register of Overseas Entities. Uh, finally, uh, there is a question of resources here, and it would be helpful to know what further resources the Scottish Government is making available to the Crown Office, who will, of course, be responsible for enforcing these new measures, especially given that the Economic Crime Bill also seeks to strengthen the UWO regime, increase and reinforce operational confidence in using UWO powers and clarify, this, clarify the scope of those powers. Uh, and one way in which it will do this is by enabling UWOs to be sought against property held in trust and other complex ownership structures. Uh, to conclude, presiding officer, the Scottish Conservatives support the Scottish Government's motion. We believe there is a clear urgency to put the measures contained within the Economic Crime Bill to effect and that Parliament should give consent to this bill. It is right and proper that as a Parliament we play our role in making our institutions more robust and to ensure that where there is illicit financial activity, we have the strongest possible measures in place to combat them. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. I rise to offer the support of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, both to the Government's uh, motion tonight and to Michael Mara's amendment. Um, a terrible human tragedy is unfolding before our eyes. I'm sure each of us was deeply moved in the heroic words of President Zelensky when he addressed uh, the Palace of Westminster last night. It reaffirmed for all of us that we must continue to stand with the people of Ukraine and do everything we can to sanction uh, Putin for the destruction that he is causing. And I should associate myself with the, the remarks of Stephen Kerr. It is Putin, not the people of Russia, that is causing this. It is his regime, and we must not lose sight of that. Whilst I'm pleased that the UK Government have brought uh, forward the Economic Crime Bill and at speed, I am disappointed that it has taken six years and this war, this illegal invasion of, of Ukraine, before the Government decided to take action to put an end to Kremlin-linked oligarchs laundering their dirty money in our country. Last month, Transparency International UK revealed that since 2016, £1.5 billion worth of property was bought by Russians accused of corruption or linked to the Kremlin. They also highlighted that more than 2,000 companies registered in the UK and its overseas territories and protectorates and crime dependencies were found to be utilised in 48 Russian money laundering and corruption cases, which involved more than £82 billion of funds diverted by rigged procurement, bribery, embezzlement and the unlawful acquisition of state assets. Presiding officer, these numbers are stark and they are eye-watering, and it is clear that something must be done. 
Unfortunately, I do not believe that the economic crime bill goes far enough in ridding us of these links to Russia, not least because there are still measures in the bill which allow the UK government to exempt an individual from declaring uh, on the register if it relates to the economic well-being of the United Kingdom. I'm proud of my Westminster colleagues and the Liberal Democrats for tabling amendments to close those loopholes, which undoubtedly allow for exploitation by oligarchs and support all the work they're doing to get this bill right. This loophole is not, however, the only concern that the Scottish Liberal Democrats have about this bill. As our former colleague in this chamber, Andy Whiteman, pointed out over the weekend, the Scottish regulations that come into force next month only go back as far as December 14. Presiding officer, this is not good enough. We must not presume that we in Scotland would have to have been exposed to, would only have been exposed to the corruption that comes with Russian oligarchs for that short period of time. Just last week, Ross Greer highlighted that Vladimir Lissin, a man whose name can be found on a 2018 US Treasury document of senior political figures and oligarchs in Russia, has reportedly owned a Perthshire estate totaling nearly £700,000 in agricultural state subsidies uh, since 2005. Signing officer, under the new rules, none of these individuals or companies will have to appear on the new register. And I'm deeply concerned that by not taking actual action, people like Listen will be able to continue owning land in Scotland without the proper scrutiny and, if needs be, penalty. That's why Scottish Liberal Democrats agree with Michael Mara and Labour and that part one of the bill should apply to all land owned and registered in Scotland, regardless of when it was acquired. By not extending the regulations so that these properties bought before December 2014 are also included in the new register, we allow ourselves to still have ties to Russian oligarchs at a time when our message should be clear that we utterly condemn the actions of President Putin, and as far as is possible, Scotland will have no ties to his regime. Presiding officer, I will close by saying this. We stand in a building that was designed with transparency in mind. When it comes to instruments of legislation like the one we are discussing tonight, we must ensure that transparency is at the very heart of them. And I fear that should these new regulations not be amended in the way that we have discussed tonight, then its provisions will allow those with ties to the brutal Putin regime to prosper still in our country. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is right to pass this motion and allow Westminster at long last to legislate on economic crime. Note, however, that the bill is only at second reading stage in the Lords, and there are some 47 pages of amendments from the Commons alone. So today we debate a motion before the content of the bill is clear, and it may well emerge deeply flawed. It shouldn't have been like this. As Oliver Bullock's new book, Butler to the World, makes clear, the UK has been the hub for international organised crime for years. Worse, it is not simply that we didn't have effective legislation. We've had multiple, particularly Tory governments, deliberately blocking reform. For example, despite the best efforts of some, and it is on the record, the UK government refused to tackle the criminality associated with Scottish limited partnerships and in doing so, in effect, colludes with economic crime and corruption. Legislation must also address UK banks. How many in this Parliament are aware that since 2010 UK regulators have imposed penalties, mostly on banks, of over £739 million for anti-money laundering failures? The National Crime Agency has stated that the amount of money laundering alone is likely to be in the hundreds of billions of pounds annually. And I've put that record, put that fact on the record on a number of occasions in this Parliament. Presiding officer, perhaps the cynic in me could suggest that the real reason the Tories in London are at last clamping down on organised corruption is that they don't like the competition. However, we must look to institutions in Scotland too. As all, Oliver Bullis' chapter on the Scottish laundromat reveals, one major Scottish law firm threatened a senior investigative journalist with the withdrawal of advertising from his paper if a story about SLP criminality was published. Said law firm fronted huge numbers of SLPs and the Law Society of Scotland have not done enough to discourage their use as submissions to various consultations make clear. So I therefore ask the, the Cabinet Secretary, whilst appreciating that the regulation resides with the UK Government, 
if the Scottish Government will consider how the use of SLPs in particular can be discouraged, perhaps by further discussions with the Law Society of Scotland. Presiding officer, what are a few of the Bill's weaknesses? Despite, despite claiming to make business vehicles more transparent, they can declare without challenge that they do not have a beneficial owner. And this, of course, makes disclosure completely optional. There's to be no disclosure of the beneficiaries of trusts that hold property. There will only be small penalties for missed deadlines and even for false filings. But the most startling of all relates to the requirement to register itself. Now, I'd have thought that secret property ownership by oligarchs and others would be considered a bad thing in all circumstances. However, the legislation allows the UK Secretary of State to exempt individuals from having to register if it's thought to be for our own well-being. Perhaps this is a perk for pals of the Secretary of State. I don't know. Of course, we've been promised another bill is coming along shortly, and this has been referenced by Michael Mara. But despite the track record of Westminster, we are supposed to believe that resources will be made available to agencies such as Companies House to implement the legislation. But that is unlike what happened with the Criminal Finances Bill back in 2017. So, of course, I fully support today's motion, but I will have to reserve judgment as to the Westminster's Bill's success. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. We now move to winding up, and I call on Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In passing this legislative consent motion today, we are able to express our solidarity with the Ukrainian people, two million of whom have now fled for safety, as their homes and communities have been destroyed in the past few days. There is so much more we can do, and we urgently need the Conservative Government to deliver access to visas, so people returning with family members or people who have made the perilous journey to our borders are able to come here and seek refuge. So we stand in solidarity and we've seen protests, citizens protesting in Scotland about the impact on Ukrainian citizens. We've seen donations to the DEC appeal and fundraising initiatives right across Scotland and rallies. And in Edinburgh today, people outside the Russian consulate, artists movingly reciting poems and singing to make the human connections and using their right to protest and campaign. But today's motion is vital because it's about tackling the issue of those who have extracted money from the Russian people and its economy and have kept it to make themselves and their families rich. The kleptocrats who've not just made money out of businesses, but then brought properties and land which have become more and more valuable over time here too. So we need transparency and we need to end for good the influence of corrupt money. Now, we believe the bill referenced in today's legislative consent motion does not go far enough. It does not stop the dirty money which is flooded into the UK economy, which Alex Cole Hamilton referenced. Promise, there was a promise of action in 2016, but it has not happened. And we have seen £1.5 billion flood into the purchase of properties where the investors have been accused of corruption or direct links to the Kremlin. So we are impatient for action. Our UK Labour colleagues attempted to amend the Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Bill to enable the legislation to expand the scope of properties purchased before 2014 in Scotland and elsewhere before 1999, and to keep the current transitional period on properties in order to get a solution to bring them into the scope of the regime being established. As Michael Mara has said eloquently, there is no logical reason why this must be the case. And the whole point of our land reform legislation in Scotland has been to increase transparency, increase the beneficial use of our land and increase community involvement and ownership. So the, example that, the examples that have been given in the Chamber today are not acceptable. We need transparency so people cannot hide their ownership and thereby escape the action and accountability which legislation is intended to deliver. So the issue of persons of significant control needs to be addressed now, not in the future. We need transparency on all the land owned and registered in Scotland. And the people of Ukraine are suffering now. They need accountability and the action we can deliver in Scotland to put pressure on Putin's regime. And if anyone has been at any of the demonstrations, 
It is hard listening to their demands for action now, so we need to listen to them and we need to do what we can. I would also say to the Cabinet Secretary we need an urgent review of the Scotland project to ensure that no one benefits from our seabed where sanctions should be imposed. Ethical concerns have been raised and should be acted upon urgently. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary in his winding up speech to say what action the Scottish Government will take on this issue to address these concerns and deliver transparency. Now, I do want to welcome the cross-party support we have had today for both the motion and the amendment. And I particularly welcome the measured speech that was made by Donald Cameron this afternoon and for his support of our party's amendment today. We are not always going to agree, disagree in this place, and part of democracy is expressing that disagreement. So I, I agree with the points made by Michelle Thompson about the, the need for more action. But I would say, in conclusion, both the Scottish Government and the UK Government must pull out all the stops to ensure that transparency is real and that we in this country can do everything we can to tackle the legacy of historic purchase by oligarchs and those who have cozied up to those in power. It has to stop now. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Thank you, President Officer. I will try and address some of the, uh, as many of the questions as I can uh, within the time available. Um, and there were quite a few questions which were raised. Um, first of all, to say that I have listened with great interest to the debate and thankful to members for expressing their support. And um, the point made by Sarah Boyack, I think, is a very important one, that um, these uh, kleptocrats will have got their money from fleecing the Russian people of billions of pounds at a point in their history where they needed that money uh, to uh, serve their own public services. And we should bear that in mind. Uh, over the past few weeks, we have been witness, of course, to the shocking actions of Putin's regime, and I take on board again the point made by Stephen Kerr about it being Putin uh, that we uh, should keep in our sights. But that uh, regime has worked against the people, democracy, and the sovereign territorial integrity of Ukraine, and the Chamber stands resolute against that unwarranted uh, aggression. Uh, the reforms to which the LCM relate are intended, and I would say they are required, to help counter the illicit financing of land and property ownership across the UK by those kleptocrats and oligarchs that support uh, Putin's uh, regime. Uh, listening to uh, Michael Mara, I thought we were about to break into a verse of this land is our land, uh, when he made some of his comments. Um, and I, I would say in relation to Scottish uh, regulations, and I think he was referring to the duplication, which I refer to in my statement, I think that will be a matter for um, uh, the Minister responsible, Mary McCallum, to look at uh, as she takes things forward in that regard, and she will be paying attention to what is said here today. That would also apply to the point made by Sarah Boyack about the, the, the seabed as well. Um, those things, of course, can be looked at. Um, as can the issue about 12, uh, 12 months coming to six uh, months, which uh, is a point that was made. Uh, some of the issues about prominent persons um, are really in the gift of the UK Government, not in the gift of this Government to deal with. Um, we want to see the maximum transparency. Um, we have uh, the uh, provisions coming forward in our own uh, bill, which was uh, long planned, um, which will help us in relation to that. And, uh, that, of course, can be uh, looked at again by this Parliament. There is no inhibition on the Parliament looking at that. Um, in relation, though, to the, uh, Michael Mara's amendment, I should say, just to be clear, the UK Government did not ask to go back beyond 2014. And in fact, I think it is unlikely they are going to agree to that. But there is no inhibition on us agreeing to the amendment, which I am happy to do. Uh, it may be that, given that uh, Donald Cameron has expressed his support for it as well, he can have a word with his colleagues uh, in London. Perhaps that would add uh, additional uh, weight um, to it. I would also say, in relation to the points made by Michelle Thompson, my colleague Ash Reagan is in the chamber and has heard the comments. I think she will have heard the comments made by Michelle Thompson in relation to the Law Society and SLPs. Um, as I have said, the, laws, the reforms to which this LCM relate are intended to deal with the illicit financing of Cabinet land and property. Secretary, sorry, could I ask you to take a seat for a moment? There are, uh, you know, I am aware of extended discussions that are continuing while you are speaking, which I am certainly finding distracting. I would be grateful if you could continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The tragic event, events in Ukraine have brought these long-standing issues to the fore, and it is undeniable that uh, now is the time. Some people have made the point that that time was some time ago to lift the veil of secrecy and shine a light on who owns most of our vital assets as a nation, our land, and help to call out the corruption and ownership of assets purchased through unlawful, unlawful conduct. 
We want to have a Scotland that is and is seen as hostile to anybody who thinks they can hide assets obtained by unlawful conduct and support the unexplained wealth order provisions which deliver key improvements to the effectiveness of UWOs as uh, part of measures which will also strengthen the financial sanctions regime that will do more to tackle corrupt regimes, businesses and individuals across the world. On the measures included in the LCM relating to a register of overseas entities, the Scottish Government is fully supportive of measures to tackle money laundering and improve transparency of land ownership. Indeed, transparency of ownership has long been a key objective of our land reform policy, and the 2016 Land Reform Act included provisions to establish, as I have mentioned, a register of persons with a controlled interest in land. It should be uh, noted uh, that UK ministers have committed to table an amendment to a sunset clause regulation making power in Schedule 4 to the Bill, which will require consultation with Scottish ministers before any regulations impacting on aspects devolved to Scotland are made. And I should say, just in passing, to take up the point made by Michelle Thompson, there is a lot further to go in this process, and we are taking quite a lot on trust from UK ministers. And I hope that trust is well placed and that the concerns that we have expressed um, are taken in the spirit in which they are attended, uh, intended and also respected as things go forward. Uh, as I have said already in relation to Mr Mara's amendment to the motion, we are entirely supportive of the sentiment behind it. But I would like to highlight that if the bill were to be amended in this manner, uh, as I have said, it would add very little to the transparency regime here in Scotland. That is really due to the nature of how people had to register before 2014, the nature of the records, there were obligations which they would have after this is passed, which they did not have then, which creates complications for taking legal action. Happy to go into that in more detail, um, but it, it is a complex uh, picture. Uh, and we have, of course, um, our own register of persons with a controlled interest in land going live on the 1st of April. That will provide transparency for land and property acquired before the 8th of December. I would also stress that time is short and the UK Bill needs to progress in an expedited manner to ensure the register of overseas entities is up and running as soon as possible. And as such, whilst we accept uh, Mr Mayer's amendment to the motion, as I have said, we have to recognise there does not seem to be the time available to the UK Government now to make those necessary changes. Um, but I have made that point already. The Scottish Government, for our part, therefore, is content with all the ROE provisions which extend into devolved competence and recommend that this Parliament gives consent to the UK Parliament to legislate for these provisions. On reforms of the UWO regime in Scotland, the Scottish Government is supportive of those measures being taken forward in the Bill. And the measures in the LCM will, as I have said, enable enforcement authorities to take more effective action against kleptocrats and serious and organised criminals who launder their funds in the UK. And it will enable UWOs to be sought against property held in trust and other complex ownership structures such as opaque foundations. So, President Officer, I am sure everyone in the Chamber will agree that corruption and the purchase of assets through unlawful conduct are not welcome in Scotland, irrespective of where the perpetrators originate. I would urge members to support the LCM, the purpose of which is really to say, going back to the song I mentioned earlier on, that this land is our land. This land is not the land of kleptocrats and oligarchs. And I would ask all members to support this LCM. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Bill UK legislation. And it's time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motions 3545, 3546 and 3547. In the name of Jackson Carlaw, on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body on nomination of a pension fund trustee for the Scottish Parliamentary Contributory Pension Fund. And I call on Jackson Carlaw to speak to and move the motions. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Before moving the motions, I would like to acknowledge, on behalf of the Parliament, the work done by the previous pension fund trustees, Alison Harris, Gil Patterson and Mark Ruskell, uh, looking after our pension scheme. Under Schedule 1 Part B, Rule 8.1 of the Scottish Parliamentary Pensions Act 2009, it is for the Parliament to appoint all trustees by resolution on nomination by the SPCB. Uh, the SPCB recently agreed to nominate Gordon MacDonald, MSP, Murdo Fraser, MSP and former MSP Mark Ballard as the pensioner trustee as fund trustees of the Scottish Parliamentary Pension Scheme to serve alongside Pauline McNeill. I therefore move these motions uh, for the Parliament to approve three new fund trustees. Thank you. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion 3488 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the appointment of the chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move the motion.
Thank you. As a member of the cross-party selection panel established by the presiding officer under our standing orders, I am delighted to be speaking to the motion in my name to invite members of Parliament to agree to nominate Ian Duddy to Her Majesty the Queen for appointment as the chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. The presiding officer chaired the selection panel and the other members were Karen Adam, Maggie Chapman, Pam Duncan Glancy and Megan Gallagher. As members will be aware, the Scottish Human Rights Commission is the National Human Rights Institute, Institution for Scotland, and its role is to promote human rights and, in particular, to encourage best practice in relation to human rights. Turning to the panel's nominee, Ian Duddy is a senior civil servant and former UK ambassador. From 2011 to 2016, he led the UK team at the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva working closely with civil society, governments and national human rights institutions. Ian has worked in Europe, South America and Afghanistan on issues including child safeguarding, gender, education and freedom of expression. Ian is currently the head of the Human Rights and Rule of Law Department at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Officer. The panel believes that Ian's blend of skills, knowledge and experience will make him an excellent chair and in partnership with the part-time members of the Commission will ensure the Commission fulfils its statutory functions, that positive working relations with stakeholders are built and maintained, and that the office is run efficiently and effectively. Lastly, Presiding Officer, I would like to mention the outgoing Chair of the Commission, Judith Robertson, who demits office later this month, and to thank her, and her for her many uh, achievements during her term of office, and to wish her all the very best for the future. Presiding officer, I move the motion. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 3526 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme and I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, presiding officer, and moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak on the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 3526 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is consideration of five Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 3527, 3528 and 3529 on approval of SSI, and 3530 and 3531 on designation of lead committees. Thank you, President Officer, and all moved. Thank you, Minister. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. There are 13 questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first is that Amendment 3491.1, in the name of Hamza Youssef, which seeks to amend Motion 3491, in the name of Anna Sarwar, on, Mi on Millie's Law, Justice for Families, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. There will be a short suspension to allow members to access digital voting systems.